Hello, Dr. Mintz again. We're going to talk now about some of the anatomy of the mediastinum and other chest structures that are non-lung. So we've gone through the lung and the fissures pretty well. So let's go into the mediastinum here. Okay. First, let's look at the, the heart, chambers of the heart. <clears throat> more and more of the imaging in CT is dedicated to the heart and coronary arteries. New, fast scanning techniques have allowed us, uh, with helical scanning, to perform high-resolution imaging of the coronary arteries. We can often see very nicely some of the structures, the chambers of the heart, and even some, and even in some cases, some of the structures in the chambers. For example, let's see if we can see them here. Of course, heart motion is going to going to degrade image quality, but if you change the windowing here, you can see what side of the heart are we in here, left or right left side. Okay? How can you tell whether it's left or right? Well, it's a little more leftward, but you don't always have that depending on the plane of your section. Maybe a little less clear to you. But it's certainly more leftward. But you can see the right side of the heart is more anterior as well as toward the right. So the left side of the heart is more, more posterior, very important, because if you cut through it like this or like this, it may become confusing if you just think about left and right. So the left side of the heart is more posterior, and it's also a little more superior. So as you go down, you see you're still in the right ventricle, but you're out of the left ventricle. As you go up, you're out of the right ventricle, but still in the left ventricle. Oh, isn't it beautiful what you can see on some of these images? Take, take a look here. Here we have the left ventricle, and what valve would that be? The aortic valve. Okay, so here you can see the left ventricle, as you course up superiorly, going into the aorta through the aortic valve. Okay, and then as you go up here, you are in the entering the arch of the aorta, and then of course it arches across. Another way to ch tell that you're in the left ventricle is the thickness of the ventricular wall. So the left ventricular wall thickness is always thicker than the right. The right you can can't see very well because there's no contrast in that at this point. <clears throat> so thicker wall is a good clue that you can be confident that you're in the left ventricle. Now, if we look here, there's still a lot of motion artifact, but if we're if this is left ventricle, this is left atrium. So this is the valve, the mitral valve between the left atrium and left ventricle. You can see that little flippy thing there. And here you can even see, even though you don't see it well, this is the this is the uh, mitral valve, and you can see it's in the same plane, the valve plane, as the aortic valve. That was Cuddles barking there as Bobby and Vicky just got back from church. Okay, so those are the chambers, and you can tell how all the valves actually are in a same plane. Now, not the same as the axial plane of cut, but they all share a common plane, the valve plane. So the aortic, the pulmonic, the mitral, and the tricuspid valves all are in the same plane and arise from the same plane of tissue. Okay, so here you see left ventricle. What are these little excrescences emanating from the myocardium? Those are papillary muscles. The papillary muscles insert 
into the margin of the mitral valve. And sometimes you can see those little tendrils, those little strings, much more clearly than this. This may be one there. This may actually not be artifactual. This may be real. One of those chordae tendinia. So the papillary muscles connect by little strings called corda tendinia. Look that up in your book. That's an important word to know. Papillary muscles, chordae tendinia. It's C-H-O-R-D-A-E, chordae, but it's chordae tendinia. And they connect to the margin of the valve. And that prevents the valve from basically turning inside out when the left ventricle contracts with all that force. What is going to keep those little flippy thin valves from flopping back into the left atrium? It is those strings, the corda tendinia, connected to the papillary muscle. Now this is one of the great little facts of anatomy that I really love, and that is that why not just connect it by strings? Why have these big sections of muscles, the papillary muscles like this, connected to the strings and not the, not the uh, strings just connected to the wall? The reason is that the, when the left ventricle contracts, it not only contracts as if closed by a, like a fist from side to side, but its length decreases too. So the whole circumference of the left ventricle decreases. And that means that the length of the ventricle decreases. That means that if the strings, the corda tendinia, were just connected to the muscle, as the length of the ventricle decreases, the valves themselves, the valve leaflets, would invert. And there would be regurgitation, meaning the blood in the left ventricle would go back into the left atrium. And that's something that does occur in some disease states. But the papillary muscles themselves contract when the myocardium does because they basically are myocardium, and that takes up the slack of the corda tendinia. Beautiful anatomic physiologic relationship there. Okay, and as we go out through the aortic valve into the aorta, we get to the aortic arch. The superior mediastinum is a critical area of anatomy to understand both on CT and on plain films. <clears throat> As you emanate superiorly from the aortic arch, you will see several vessels arise. All right, so let's go down here and at below the aortic arch. And as we come up, we will see one vessel coming off the aortic arch there. What is that? The brachiocephalic artery. Brachiocephalic artery, in turn, gives rise to two vessels, the right common carotid artery and right subclavian artery. The right subclavian artery itself then gives rise to the vertebral artery, which I'm not seeing altogether well here. But at least let's just look at the subclavian. The subclavian artery goes over like this toward the axilla and then becomes the axillary artery and then goes down into the arm. Let's go back to the aortic arch. So the first vessel off the aortic arch is the brachiocephalic artery. The next one is the left common carotid artery. And the next is the left subclavian artery. There are some variants from that, but this is what most people have, the great majority. So it's very important that you know this because you must be able to identify all of the vessels in the superior mediastinum. And that means if you see an image like this, <clears throat> and I point to this vessel, this vessel, and this vessel, you must realize that these have to be 
brachycephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. It's critical that you know that even if you don't have the aortic arch, you should know that three vessels coming off the aortic arch are going to be the brachycephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. And you need to know that and can know that because you also know the venous anatomy. Now take a look here. What do we have here? Superior vena cava. And here we have the left brachycephalic vein. The left brachycephalic vein, which has, in this case, a catheter in it, a central venous line. It looks like the catheter is opacified, but the vein is not. Okay, so that's the... So looking at the superior mediastinum, this is a typical scenario, superior vena cava. There is a catheter coming into the superior vena cava that seems to have contrast in it. And here is the left brachycephalic vein. So actually, I, I should be more cautious here. Technically, it is the superior vena cava when the two have joined. So as you go down, this is superior vena cava. And then as you go up, This is, you're actually now getting into the br right brachycephalic vein, and this is the left brachycephalic vein. Okay? So actually, I misspoke there because this is the right brachycephalic vein opacified with contrast. This is the left brachycephalic vein with a catheter in place. And if you see this, and this is something that actually came up on a test last year, if you see these, the left brachycephalic vein, and it's not yet actually merged with the other vessel, this technically then would not be the superior vena cava. It is the right brachycephalic vein. But if you go down below that level and they have merged, you are now in the SVC, superior vena cava. So a an image like this would tell you right brachycephalic vein, left brachycephalic vein right brachycephalic artery or just brachycephalic artery because there's only one, left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. What do we have here? Trachea and esophagus. So you should be very good with all of those structures. And if you go up higher, you can get a little more tricky because they're starting to dive off in different directions. Here you see the right subclavian artery heading superiorly and a little posteriorly there. But it is important, even if it could be hard to identify all the vessels on this, and I, I wouldn't ask you that because it's confusing for me. And I'm not going to ask you something I can't answer myself without tracking the vessels down but you should be able to identify them, and I can, in some cases I will, post little video clips that allow you to go back and forth on an exam and look at these. Yeah. And you see, if you follow them back, you can say, okay, this is the brachycephalic artery, and as you follow it up, it's going to divide into the subclavian artery the right subclavian artery and the right vertebral artery. I'm sorry, that's misspoken again. This will course up superiorly. And what does the brachycephalic artery give? It gives off the right subclavian and the right common carotid. I apologize. Okay, so this is the right brachycephalic artery or the brachycephalic artery and as you follow it superiorly you see the uh, right common carotid artery and right subclavian artery and then if you follow those superiorly you have right common carotid artery right subclavian artery and you want to get tricky and say well where's the vertebral artery I think I can see it coming off right here and going 
up. Up, and you can actually even see it here starting to enter the paravertebral tissues and going through the foramen transversarium of the ver vertebra. Okay, good. Well, I messed up for a moment there, but that's fine because it'll make you rethink and the same way I had to and make sure that you're 100% confident with this. Aortic arch, follow it up. First vessel coming off. Brachycephalic artery. Brachycephalic artery gives off the right common carotid artery. And here you see that coming off. And right subclavian artery. Right common carotid artery is going to go up in the neck. Right subclavian artery is going to give off a vertebral artery. And then the subclavian artery itself will course over on top and anteriorly deep to the clavicle, hence the word subclavian, and continue over as the axillary artery. Three great vessels coming off the aortic arch, brachiocephalic artery, left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. If we follow the left subclavian artery up, it doesn't have to give off a common carotid artery as the right did, because the common carotid artery on the left arises directly from the aortic arch. But it still should give off a vertebral artery. Let's see if we can see it in this case. Mm, not really. Not okay, there it is. Okay, it comes off right here. Right there. So I'm going down. Here's left subclavian artery. As it goes up, there's the left vertebral artery going right there. And then it does this little loop right there. And then it goes up into the paravertebral tissues here. So that's left vertebral artery, right vertebral artery. I wouldn't ask you that at this point, but it's important anatomy for you to be familiar with. You need to know that the subclavian artery gives rise to the vertebral artery on both sides. Here you see the thyroid gland, and it's important to know that there's a right lobe, a left lobe, and an isthmus. Here, of course, is the trachea, and even though there's nothing air or fluid or food in the esophagus here, you should know that a soft tissue lump like that behind the trachea is going to be the esophagus, and usually if you follow it down, you will see little components of air in it. So this is air in the esophagus. Now, one of my favorite little vessels here is the azagous vein. See this azagous vein? The azagous vein courses as I go down from this point right by the azagoesophageal recess, which is this little recess here. So the azagous vein is in here, and it carries some of the venous return from the abdomen. So the azagous vein course is superiorly here alongside the esophagus and then at about the level of the carina it hooks up or anteriorly and superiorly arching over the right main stem bronchus. Let's look at that. See here is the right main stem bronchus. So if I go up to the top of that and change the window you can see that coursing right over it, hooked around it and over it, is the azagous vein. And this is the arch of the azagous, and it hooks into the superior vena cava. Very important structure to know because sometimes lines will go in there incorrectly. You will see the dilutional effect of the unopacified blood from the azagous vein going into the superior vena cava. So here you have opacified superior vena cava. And then here you can see the unopacified blood from the azagous vein shooting into the superior vena cava. And so you have opacified blood here and unopacified blood from the azagous vein. And then they kind of mix. And if you didn't understand that, you might think this is some kind of blood clot or mass in the superior vena cava. Very common appearance there.
Now looking at the pulmonary artery, you can see that it comes from the right side of the heart. And now, even though the right side of the heart is unopacified, the blood there, as opposed to the left side, we can see that unopacified blood, therefore, can be followed superiorly and anteriorly in the main pulmonary artery. And the critical relationship of the pulmonary artery to the aortic arch is this, that the pulmonary artery arises anteriorly and then dives back posteriorly under the aortic arch. And that's what we see here is the pulmonary artery diving back posteriorly, giving rise to the right main pulmonary artery, and more superiorly, the left main pulmonary artery. And that's an important relationship to understand. The right main pulmonary artery is more inferiorly positioned because it courses anterior to the right main stem bronchus, whereas the left main pulmonary artery reaches up and over the nearby left main stem bronchus. So here's the left main stem bronchus, and as we go up from that, we see the left main pulmonary artery coursing superiorly over it. Very important relationship because this relationship will help you identify which pulmonary artery you are seeing on a plane film of the chest, both in the PA and lateral projections. This then is the carina. You see that little dividing point between the right main stem and the left main stem bronchus. And you should be able to identify the main stem bronchi, the carina, the trachea, as well as the main, at least the lobar branches of the pulmonary arteries. So if we go up here and we follow the trachea down and we say how is the right upper lobe ventilated, we see the first bronchus coming out. It's more, it's kind of anterior, which is what you'd expect because here you can see right lower lobe, right upper lobe, and here is the major fissure. So the right upper lobe bronchus extends superiorly and then it branches to the segmental bronchi, which include the anterior segment, the apical segment, and the posterior segment of the right upper lobe. And it's difficult to see very clearly each of those, but at this point it's trifurcating or bifurcating to the apical segment, the anterior segment, and posterior segments of the upper lobe. Following the right main stem down farther, we encounter a very critical segment of the bronchus, and that is the segment of bronchus between where the right upper lobe bronchus arises and where the right middle lobe and right lower lobe bronchi arise. And that segment of bronchus between the right upper lobe, main, uh, right upper lobe bronchus and right middle lobe and right lower lobe is the bronchus intermedius. Very critical area. So from this point down, this is the bronchus intermedius. And then the bronchus intermedius divides into right middle lobe bronchus, which is going more anteriorly, which is just what you'd expect because here you see the minor fissure caught tangentially, absence of the vascular markings, and this right middle lobe bronchus, then you can see branching into the lateral segment and medial segment of the right middle lobe, whereas the right lower lobe bronchus comes down like this and branches into medial segment, posterior segment, lateral segment and anterior segment, which I think of more conceptually than in terms of strict anatomy because the anatomy there is more variable, but generally there are four segments. So a critical area of anatomy then 
is the bronchus intermedius. This again is a structure that you can appreciate well on chest x-rays, both PA and lateral. So this is at least as good, probably better, than doing a cadaver dissection and under, for understanding these anatomic relations. Now if we look at the left, we see the left main stem bronchus, and since there are only two lobes there, there is no bronchus intermedius. Remember that on the right, the bronchus intermedius is the segment of bronchus between where the right upper lobe bronchus comes off and, more inferiorly, where the right middle lobe and right lower lobe bronchus come off. So this would be bronchus intermedius. On the left, however, the left main stem bronchus divides and gives off the left upper lobe bronchus and the left lower lobe bronchus. There will be lingular branches of the left upper lobe bronchus that will head down anteriorly and inferiorly, probably like that area right there, to go to the lingula. Now the lingula wraps around the cardiac silhouette and that's why you lose the border of the heart on chest x-rays because it's continuous with or adjacent to the cardiac sil silhouette and that is the silhouette sign. So you lose the left cardiac silhouette and it usually reflects consolidation or infiltrate or atelectasis, some type of process in the lingula. On the right side, of course, you have the right cardiac silhouette abutting the minor fissure. I mean the, in the middle lobe. And so middle lobe consolidation, middle lobe atelectasis or any type of airspace disease can, if, can cause a silhouette sign and loss of the cardiac silhouette on a chest x-ray. So here, for example, we even have a little bit of atelectasis here. And you can see how even though it's very slight, you are actually losing on CT a little bit of that cardiac border. And that too is a silhouette sign. Silhouette sign is not restricted to plain film radiography. We have the same type of phenomenon on CT, although you can usually distinguish the anatomy despite the presence of a silhouette sign, whereas on a chest x-ray, you usually cannot. Remember also that the left lower lobe has fewer segments. It has three segments on the left as opposed to four lower lobe segments on the right. And that's because instead of a posterior and a medial segment, you have a posterior medial segment, but you also have an anterior and lateral. And accordingly, you have, cor you have bronchi, segmental bronchi. The concept of segment, even though you can't really see the anatomy clearly and cannot distinguish where one segment ends and another begins, you know that it's present. You can identify it. You have these three bronchi here, so you have a sense of where these things are. But we don't, it's difficult to be sure what segment it's in unless it's very Dream and, you know, like on the right, if it's very posterior, you're pretty sure it's a posterior basal segment. If it's very lateral, it's probably lateral basal segment, but it's hard to tell exactly where one ends and another begins. But the concept of segment still is very important as a structural and functional component of the lung. And if there is blood or pus or tumor or something occluding a bronchus, very often what you will see is an, either a segment or a portion of segment collapse, become atelectatic. And actually, now that I think about it, that's probably what we have going on here. Let's see if we can dissect that a little bit more. Okay, so we go up here and we have major fissure. We're going down. Here's the minor fissure. So we're below the minor fissure. Major fissure is here. <coughs> So this is some atelectasis in the anterior basal segment of the right lower lobe. See how it works? It's up against the major fissure there. So anterior basal segment of the right lower lobe abutting the major fissure.
looking at the carina level again, this is one of my favorite vessels. What is it? Azagous vein. What's this with the air in it? Esophagus. What are we looking at here? This is the level of the carina. You may not actually be able to point to the carina because the carina is kind of just that peak that you see better on a chest x-ray or on a coronal image. But we're here at the level of the carina, and you should see that. You can see that the, this is just above the carina, the carina being that beak basically right here. Carina actually means beak. So following in fairly from that level, you now have the esophagus, and if you follow that, you should be able to see it pretty well. See it quite well there. And what I noticed is this patient has something right here. And <clears throat> you can have a fluid-filled esophagus that can give you an appearance like that. But this seems very eccentric to where the esophagus is. I can see the esophagus here anterior to the descending thoracic aorta. So I think this is a large mediastinal node. That's what I would be concerned about here. I don't see any tumors in the mediastinum or in the lung, so I don't think it's a lung cancer. But you look in the liver, and there are numerous very large masses. Two things, well, actually three things, we commonly see causing masses in the liver, and we usually think of metastases, of course, if they're as extensive as this. Most common is going to be, the three most common at least, will be lung cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer. Lung more often than breast. Colon uh, is a less common cancer than lung, and less common to cause extensive metastases like this, but colon cancer tends to produce these big masses, and they're sometimes called here we see very large masses here. Let me just give you an idea. Okay, so these are sometimes called cannonball lesions. You see how big this one is? Cannonball mets, cannonball lesions, because they're large, and they actually are replacing much of the substance of the liver. And we'll get into that anatomy a little bit more, but you can see that the right and left lobes are involved. Now, this is, this is the, not just the left lobe. This is not all the left lobe. This is the lateral segment of the left lobe. And the medial segment is here. Okay, so extensive metastases. To the liver. Okay, we've gone through most of the anatomy here. Let me just finally touch on one area. And you got this in the lecture of PECT, and that is that this is the main pulmonary artery, and it branches into the right and left pulmonary arteries, as I described earlier. And this is where we try to optimally produce contrast and enhancement when we're going to do a PECT. Now, if you look here, you can barely discern. You see that little tiny air bubble right there. You might think that's concerning, but it happens all the time. This little air bubble is very anterior because it's floating up in the main pulmonary artery. It's the most ventral part of the pulmonary arterial system. What does it come from? The IV line. There's always going to be a little air, a little air bubbles here, and it's no concern. A small amount of air in the main pulmonary artery commonly occurs, and it's probably why things were designed in this manner where the pulmonary artery is 
feeding to the lungs and everything from the pulmonary artery then goes back to everything from the lungs go back to the left side of the heart. So the lungs actually act as a filter, whether intentionally or not. And so air bubbles and little clots tend to go to the lung, which is fine if they're small and few because the lungs are redundant. They are numerous parallel channels of artery, de arteries bringing deoxygenated blood to the lungs, veins bringing oxygenated blood, blood back from the lungs. And these are numerous parallel systems. And if tiny little areas of lung become affected and blood flow to a small area of lung becomes blocked off from a pulmonary embolus, a little blood clot, or a little air pocket, that will resolve with time, and it's not enough to significantly affect the level of oxygenation. It's only when numerous pulmonary emboli occur, or large pulmonary emboli, and you've seen examples of that. So the pulmonary arteries branch and they follow the bronchi. So you can always tell if you see a vessel in the lung, <coughs> excuse me, you can tell if it's pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein because the pulmonary arteries follow the bronchi. The pulmonary veins do not. And how can you follow, how can you identify the pulmonary veins? Well, not only do they not follow the bronchi, but they come back to the left atrium. So here you can follow veins out. Not a real good example, but here is the main pulmonary vein coming, and if we go coming into the left atrium, and if you follow it down, you can see that these are small pulmonary veins. Okay, so that's pretty much the mediastinal anatomy I wanted you to have. Should be comfortable with that. Email me with any questions. Also remember when you're looking at a chest, always check the axilla. That's something I have in my report. Just to give you an idea of how I put a report together for the chest, no matter what the indication is, lung cancer or pulmonary embolism, CHF, pneumonia, a normal report would be the lungs are clear, there are no pleural effusions. There's no pneumothorax. The heart and mediastinal structures appear intact. The thoracic aorta specifically appears unremarkable. There's no mediastinal or hilar lymphadenopathy or mass. If there's been trauma, I will specify that there's no mediastinal hematoma. The axillary regions appear normal. The visualized bony structures, including the thoracic vertebra, appear intact. And this is all important to mention because in having this litany of items that you are describing, whether normal or not, it forces you and reminds you to look at all of this anatomy. Okay, that's it for now.